This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 946, recorded on October 14th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, a research assistant position is available at the FDA in the laboratory of Amy Rosenfeld. A focus of research in the Rosenfeld lab at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Review at the FDA is to understand the observation that there are cross-species antibodies against different enteroviruses. She made that observation at the end of her time in my laboratory and now has moved her research down to the FDA where she'd like to know what does it mean in terms of viral pathogenesis. And to do that, she'd like to make some animal models for the various enteroviruses. And the research assistant will assist her in studying the cross-reactivity in cells and culture and in animal models. All of the experiments will be done at BSL-2 conditions. If you're interested in the position, there's a link to a PDF in the show notes, or you can email Amy at amy.rosenfeld at fda.hhs.com. Gov. Since our first fundraiser announcement in September for spike shirts at vaccinated.us to support our work here at Microbe TV, many people have purchased shirts to show their support for us as well as for the protein of the year, spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. The promotion's been extended to October. It now includes shirts for kids and also in different colors. So if you'd love to wear a Spike t-shirt and if you'd love to support our work here at Microbe TV, go over to vaccinated.us, pick out your shirts, put them in the cart. When you check out, use the promo code Microbe TV and the profits will be sent to us. Many thanks to vaccinated.us and Matt for their support of our science communication work. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody. Hello, Vincent. This turned out to be a perfect day uh, in terms of weather, at least. Um, it's about 71 or 2 degrees outside right now. Almost no humidity. It rained like hell last night, but it cleared off very nicely, and it's it's absolutely worth enjoying going out and actually enjoying that day. It's too bad we can't save them for other days, but we can't. All anyway, right. Hello. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's uh, still kind of overcast and mostly cloudy here, um, but it's clearing up. We had a whole bunch of rain and uh, that's clearing out the 67 Fahrenheit, which is 16 cell. Oh, they've got it at 60 Fahrenheit, 16 C, so 61, 16. Got that thing going on. Um, also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. And let's see. Uh, we got 87 degrees headed for 90. Uh, but according to the forecast, it's going to crash on Monday, cold front bringing temperatures of 72 and then not returning to 90 for the foreseeable future. So maybe Fry we'll me turn a river. Fry me a river. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, I have the same gorgeous weather that Dixon has. It is 68, sunny and just a really nice fall day here. Our guest today is from Montreal, Canada, McGill University, Angela Mingarelli. I get to say my Italian accent, Mingarelli. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. I'm here in Montreal. It is 15C, which is 59 Fahrenheit, so it's the coldest here. And it's, it's kind of sunny now, but it's been overcast and raining for the last three days. Um, and it's supposed to rain tomorrow, but it's not too cold for Canada. It's only we've only just begun. Things will get definitely a lot what, colder soon. What could be what could be better than a name that ends in two L's and a vowel? It's got to end in a vowel. <laughs> yeah, O or I, like Rack and Yellow Mingarelli. You know, yeah, it's really good. Angela, take heart. The the hockey season is about to start. Yes, it is. Yeah. Are you a hockey fan, Dixon? 
I was and, until the Rangers actually did something. <laughs> and then <laughs> they actually did something last year. They made the playoffs. So I watched a lot and I, I realized that uh, all of those players, they have U.S. teams, but they've all got Canadian names. Of course, the Canadians have great hockey players, right? Yeah, yeah. great hockey so, players. So the, the Madison Square Garden is two blocks from here, my studio. And the Rangers play there, of course, Dixon, right? That is their home. That is correct. Uh, and below me is a bar where all the fans go before the game and after oh, the game. Yes. They're, they're oh, all yes. wearing Ranger t-shirts. That's right. That's right. That's right. So crowded. Oh, my Mark gosh. Messier shirts. Well, <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> hockey fans are generally a quiet, polite crowd. So you don't really? have to worry about so no, no big deal. <laughs> Alan, I think so, you're out of I mean, because here. it's such a gentle sport, you'd expect you to well, attract people know, like that. That's true. They don't even I, touch the, the puck. They use sticks. Yes. <laughs> so, Angela, you're in a McGill University Research Center on complex traits. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, I, you have to explain, what is a complex trait? <laughs> so it's very difficult to explain. It's basically there are people <laughs> in the MRCCT that are part of like everything. There's immunology labs, there's virology labs, there are bioinformatics labs. We have, I think there's 30 collaborators. So there's 30 members of the complex traits um, here at McGill. And okay. yeah, on my floor, we have three labs in immunology. And then one is more like molecular uh, biology. And then another is, what do they do? Well, they're immunology, I guess, immunology adjacent. And then microbiology, one of them works with Salmonella, Dr. Grunheide, she's on our floor. Um, but yeah, it's a very interdisciplinary group. Uh, All right, so they came up with a name that would encompass everyone, yeah. basically. It's kind, of it's, kind of, it's kind of a microbiology, <laughs> immunology, and adjacent. Microbiology, yeah, microbiology, immunology, um, like biochemistry, even like we have um, the work in progress seminars are very interesting because obviously there's 30 different labs with 30 different um, mm -hmm. like projects, and they're actually really interesting. We have one coming this Monday, so. You're right, Rich. Uh, well, it's, it's complex. It's complex. It, yeah. is complex. it sounds like a biology think tank, and it's, it sounds exciting. Is it? It is. Well, no, it's cool because you get, like, when we present our work at these work in progress seminars, there's people that are in your field, people that are outside of your field that can give insight on your project that you would never think of because they're in they just haven't thought of the question in the way that you have, or they don't have sure. maybe the biases that you have in your field or hmm. especially in bioinformatics, they help a lot if you're not as bioinformatics savvy and yeah, it's good. Do you have uh, any basic ecology uh, represented there? No, not in the MRCCT now. Is that, the, I don't. Uh, that this, you're not in the medical <laughs> no. school, right? You're in the, uh, you're at the university. Well, the, the, we're the the faculty of medicine, and okay. I'm in the department of physiology. Yeah. Okay, you are in the medical school. So, Dixon, a, a medical yeah. school usually doesn't have an ecology or ecologist, right? Yeah. You're right. They mm -hmm. they don't, but sometimes they should. I think school of public health should. Yeah, I agree. Sure. I agree. So, uh, Angela, you are a PhD student there, correct? Yes, I am. And sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, here in, yeah, Dr. Judith Mandel's lab. So mm -hmm. we, uh, she opened her lab in 2015. I am the second year student. I'll be finishing my second year in January, starting my third. And uh, my lab, so I'm, I can give you like a brief background on who I am, where I came from, if yeah, you guys want. Please. Uh, yes, please. Yes, we do. That's what I'm working on. Yeah, so I'm Italian Canadian, as Vincent said. Angela Mingarelli, obviously Italian name. Um, and what is Italian Canadian? You were born in Italy and then grew up in Canada. No, I was born in Ottawa, but oh. my dad got us all Italian passports when we were children, so I have dual citizenship. Oh, ah. where's your dad from? In Italy. Uh, so no. he was born in Montreal. But my grandparents immigrated like a year before he was born, like very briefly. So my uncle was born in Italy. Okay. They were they came from Rome. All right, and then sorry. go ahead. Did I just hear you pronounce your last name? Mingarelli? Yeah, okay. I just wanted yeah, to come. Mingarelli. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> 
being at India. Um, so yeah, I was born in Ottawa and then I lived there until I was like a mid teen. And then I actually moved to Spain with my father because he was on sabbatical. So he's a mathematician and he was on sabbatical for two years. So because I was underage, I was 17, 16, almost 17. And my younger brother, we moved to Spain with him uh, to the Canary Islands where I lived nice. for 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Where I lived for most of my adult life. So, wow. um, and I actually went to vet school there. So I'm a trained veterinarian, which to preface this with, I'm a PhD student, but I'm actually a veterinarian. Um, I went to vet school in the Canary Islands and I could only do so because my dad got us these passports, Italian passports when I was a kid. Which island did you uh, habitate? <laughs> Grand Canaria. The, the Grand one. Canaria. My wife and I have yeah. been to the Canary Islands, so we had a marvelous trip. Is your father at all associated with the astronomy uh, groups that are there? So he he has been to the to the observatory at La Palma yeah, because yeah, he has yeah, some yeah. friends. Yeah, yeah. Because my sister is also an astrophysicist, so she knew someone there, and then he knew someone there, and he's part of the astronomical society. So it was a whole thing. Yes. He so was. let me get this straight: you come from humble background. Is that what you're telling us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my a family of scientists. Lord. <laughs> Diverse, though. I'm the only one in the life sciences. Everybody uh, else is in math and physics. Well, only two of my family members. My other family works not in science uh, specifically, like my brother, he studied Roman antiquities, which is very different, but so interesting. Like whenever we talk yeah. about, mm. yeah, it's it's amazing. So you, got, um, you got a vet degree in, in Spain, then what'd you do after that? Yeah, so then as I was finishing my degree in veterinary medicine, uh, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, where we were in Spain, if you guys remember, locked inside for like three months. So we couldn't leave. We could literally only go outside to walk our dog within, because I had a dog. If, if you didn't have a dog, you couldn't even leave your house. Um, 50 meters, like around my house is where I could go. And I didn't drive in Spain. So my boyfriend, he could go to the grocery store, but I couldn't. So I literally was confined to my 80 meter uh, square, like, well, I guess, what chance am I literally? Yeah, 80 meter squared apartment. It was very small. Um, and then I was finishing. So as I was finishing my degree, I knew that I wanted to go into research because during vet school, um, I just, I wasn't really, I don't want to say fully satisfied, but um, medicine is, is I guess, a lot of the time very, um, you can't do certain tests to reach certain conclusions um, or to get a mechanism specifically. A lot of it is symptomatic treatment because obviously, especially in veterinary medicine, like it's expensive and um, mostly financially and timing because if an animal or even in human medicine is dying. Obviously, you can't do all of the different assays to pinpoint the, etiolo the etiological agent or like exactly what's causing it. And because I'm such a curious person, I was like, no, I need to know why. What are these like, what are these specific immune mechanisms that are causing all of these? So naturally, I was like, well, I should go into research. So um, so I went on to the website. So I went on to the McGill website. Uh, the University of British Columbia and the University of Toronto. Those are the three universities I was looking at in Canada because I knew I wanted to come back to Canada because I had been living in Spain for 12 years and my family all lived in Canada. So, um, so I literally went through the faculty members one by one. It was nothing glamorous. It was just, okay, who has research that I find interesting? And then eventually I found uh, Judith, so Judith Mandel, my, my PI, and she had this really interesting paper on, um, there was a bat review. So she had a review in Frontiers in Immunology that she had written regarding like bat immunology that I found really fascinating. Uh, and then also there was a, a cell paper that she wrote with Peter Daszak and Rafi Ahmed on reservoir host immune responses to different emerging viruses, which caught my attention, even though her lab is T cell based. So it's that we do a lot of T cell migration. Uh, we also have projects on mechanosensing and on T cell heterogeneity on aging in T cells. But then there was like these one or two papers on bats. And I was like, Hmm. So I reached out to her and a few other uh, researchers, but her specifically. 
And she actually got back to me, which was like a gleam of like hope in the middle of the pandemic. I was sitting in my house. I remember when she answered my email, I was ecstatic. I was so excited. So we communicated via Zoom and uh, and yeah, she basically accepted me. So in Montreal, we don't do like the uh, rotations like you do in the US before you enter into a lab, but you have to commit like first year, you, you commit directly to a lab um, and that's it. So I came to Canada met her for the first time in person, already forming part of her lab, um, which was like, I guess people could say it was risky, but it worked out really well. I've been here for two years now, so it's going very well. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's it. What other information? That's good. So, uh, yeah. And, we, and I have to say, that's a great explanation of how to pick a graduate school for anybody who's mm -hmm. thinking, gee, I'd like to go into research in something. Um, start mm -hmm. with what interests you and find out who's working on that and then focus on those places. And if you find a place yeah. that's got two or three people work as if it's a place that does rotations, if you find a place that's got three or four people working on what you like, that's ideal. But in your case, you, you knew exactly where you were going. Yeah, no, it, it's some people say like it's glamorous and they had like one person in mind and they knew exactly, which is fine. But I feel like that's only maybe like three percent of graduate students have that most of us literally at least as those that i've spoken with you go onto the website you for weeks it took me weeks to find something that i was actually that interested in so much of it i was just like no nope. instantly i was like no nope, no nope. oh this is cool and then i'd read about it and be like mm, not really but uh, uh, so what what was it about bats that captured your interest well, what, how could you not like bats? Okay. First of all, there's like <laughs> we, we are big bat fans here, so it's yeah, it's kind of a kind of an easy question, but there's like literally over what a thousand three hundred species. I, there's a specific number. I think it's a thousand two hundred and forty nine. I should know this this number. Actually, a new species was identified when we were at the conference that Vincent also attended in uh, in Fort Collins. Hmm. So I should know this number, but it's close. Um, they're it's just fascinating. Close, yeah. yeah, they're they're fascinating mammals. Everything about them. Obviously, I find the immune aspect the most interesting. That they can be reservoirs and carriers of all of these lethal or lethal to humans. These viruses, these RNA viruses, that to them seemingly cause them no harm, is insane in my mind. Which most people don't even know bats are mammals, which is also surprising because they're like, oh no, they're like birds right or they're like reptiles and birds. i'm like no they're animals <laughs> and they don't have hollow bones they're not birds they don't have air sacs and pneumatized skeletons they are they are no mammals. nucleated blood cell red blood cells no, yeah. exactly. <laughs> they are only one of three vertebrate species to have acquired flight so we have bats mm -hmm. we have birds and what's the third anybody know yeah yeah because right. i was here the other yeah. day <laughs> yeah. yeah we cheated but yeah. wait, pterodactyls pterodactyls did i say it the other day yes, you, did. Yes, you, did. you said it the other day <laughs> and many species have lost flight anyway rich that's a curveball over the middle of the plate right <laughs> <laughs> so uh we met at the bat meeting in fort collins and uh angela expressed an interest in science communication so we have always uh, wanted a veterinarian now and then on twiv so i said why don't you come on and see how it works yeah. out so that's here and and we're also using zoom for the first time in two years and we're going to blame angela for if there's any problems because <laughs> we couldn't get other things to work but it's fine we'll work that out so i said angela pick a paper and come on so uh, the first paper we'll do is all Angela's. So go for it, Angela. Yeah. So, um, so do you want, are we going to, we're not going to share a screen. We're just going to discuss it, right? Like yeah. the, yep. just discuss. Yep. All of that. Okay. Um, so this paper is actually, when I saw it, I was mostly fascinated because my PI <laughs> Judith and another collaborator, Dr. Ira King, we had actually spoken or toyed with the idea of doing something like this, where we were thinking of, taking germ-free mice, these mice weren't germ-free specifically, but taking germ-free mice and then depleting the microbiome 
and then seeding them with a, a bad microbiome. So when I saw this paper, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Somebody did this. But um, so the idea is very interesting, the question, but the results weren't as, I guess, um, the findings aren't as striking, I should say. Um, but the but the idea, the question behind um, behind this paper, I think is interesting. Actually, one of my fellow grad students, his lab is just like right there. These are all the labs on our floor. Um, Nathan Markarian, he sent me this paper, which is how I found it. And um, yeah, so considering bats, as we know, we just said they're, they carry all of these viruses, they're reservoirs of, of many RNA viruses, but seemingly don't uh, fall ill or asymptomatically. This group wanted to uh, ask the question of if the, the, the microbiome itself of bats is somehow involved in this apparent tolerance that they have to, to these viruses. And because obviously we know that the microbiome can, can modulate a lot the or modulate aspects of our certain aspects of the immune system. So there have been different defined compartments like the gut liver access, how the gut can also influence um, different populations, cell populations in the liver, like um, Kupfer cells and different like TLR4 signaling in the liver, things like that. Um, there's also a gut brain axis and gut lung axis, which all of these commensals and different microorganisms do help shape or educate the immune system to, to a certain extent. So they wanted to ask this question if bats specifically, is it something about their microbiome that gives them this tolerance to um, viral infection? So, uh, so um, do you remember at the meeting, multiple people said, we actually don't know enough about infections of bats to say they never get sick from virus infections, right? We, True. Right? So we just haven't looked enough. So the, in fact, they make a statement in this paper. And please, when I'm done on my soapbox, give the, the title and the journal and the, uh, the authors. It says, you know, why bats can carry a lot of pathogens without getting sick. I just don't think that's an appropriate statement because we haven't looked enough and they said that at the bat meeting remember Angela? yeah if i yeah. recall correctly at that meeting that's right you were there too yeah um there were a few talks where people were actually trying to look at body temperature and trying to look at yeah um, whether or not there were any kind of symptoms or whether there was any kind of pathology and they were able to identify um some disease so i think that that is also a really interesting piece to this yeah, I had the I had the same I had the same question. I was going to you know basically challenge the whole premise and ask whether bats really are special in this regard as as reservoirs or if they've just been scapegoated somehow for some. Reason. I think importantly, I said they seemingly <laughs> asymptomatic, so they're not not that they aren't. Like they definitely, like people have seen exactly temperature fluctuations. Like we know that bats are heterothermic, so they can, their body temperature, even as mammals can range from 33 degrees to 42 degrees. This is, which is insane for a Are we, for a are we heterothermic? Are humans heterothermic? Uh, no, no. Our, our body temperature is always around. No, if your, body guess, like, if your body temperature was 42 degrees, Vincent, you would not be hosting the show right now. <laughs> so what else is exactly heterothermic more. besides bats? I'm Pathologic. Just what, what um, fish, fish, mammals. Yeah. Mammals, bats that I can off the top of my head, but definitely other amphib amphibians as well. Um, also okay. heterothermic All right. and fish. Right. But generally but, things with uh, mammals don't have this characteristic. We, uh, we're all one temperature, you know, whatever it is. Is it called species. homothermic? Homothermic, the... I think is the. All right. right. So bats are unusual that they're heterothermic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Birds are poikilothermic, as I recall. Which, what does that mean? It means that when they're born, their body temperature is whatever the adjacent temperature is, the ambient temperature, and then they eventually become warm-blooded. But during that critical period, they're vulnerable to temperature changes and things of this sort. They start okay. out uh, without the ability to regulate their body temperature, and then they develop that over time. But I was going to ask Angela whether um, the rumor that bats don't get sick from these pathogens might have started by knowing 
that when you do surveys for bats and you then look for the rabies virus, you find it. Now, we don't, <laughs> you don't usually find an animal that's suffering from rabies able to fly at night and catch insects and go back and feed their young and then go to sleep. So I think maybe that's where this rumor started that uh, the, like sharks don't get cancers. That's not true. And the answer to, to bats probably die from lots of pathogens of their own. But what about our pathogens? Why, yeah, it seems like we talk about a lot, like with my supervisor, that it's, I shouldn't generalize by saying pathogens, but RNA viruses specifically. So single stranded RNA viruses are the main, um, I guess you'd say there are many, the reservoirs for many single stranded RNA viruses that are, even if they are, maybe they do have some degree of illness, but compared to the to the presentation in other mammalian species, like in humans, it's definitely dampened. Because if even Nipah virus, like Nipah virus, which is like fatal, or even Hendra virus that's fatal in horses, bats are carrying it with, um, I guess we should say a lesser of an immune response, but we don't even know that. We don't know if there's an immune response, but they're definitely not portraying the symptoms that other species would. So there's some sort of dampening or okay. modulation tolerance we would i would say right. they're more mm -hmm. tolerance mechanisms um, right. so, so just yeah. just by inference i mean you see these viruses in the bat population at a level that would not be sustainable if they were very sick at right. least right. but it's certainly right. not right. we can't say oh they don't get sick at all from these viruses because we haven't really checked that yeah and, and i do think that there is some literature and i think that there's been some argument in the literature as well about whether they are kind of special for the number of potentially um potential spillover pathogens right um that uh, particularly those single strand rna viruses that angela mentions um mm -hmm. that they may have and so i think all of this is definitely important um whether or not the bats want to go to the opera. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Exactly right. So, Angela, tell us the title and authors. And it's, it's in an unusual Sorry. journal that I don't look at all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Transboundary and Emerging Diseases, is the journal. And the name of the paper is The Gut Microbiota of Bats Can First Tolerance to Influenza Virus H1N1 Infection in Mice. First author is Boyo, I'm sorry if I pronounce the names wrong, um, Boyo Liu from the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Jilin Agriculture University in Changchun, China. And the last author is Tingle Jiang, also from Changchun, China, but from the um, Jilin Provincial Key Laboratory of Animal Resources Conservation and Utilization, Northeast Normal University. Um, which I looked onto his um, his bio actually, and they do a lot of um, like feeding. Like they look a lot at different feeds and how that can modulate the microbiome and um, different diets of, of different insectivorous bats. So they don't only work on bats; they have a few other projects. But um, yeah, I couldn't find too much other information regarding the group, but. Um, to tell us what they did. Right. So, so they wanted to look at this. My, what is what is the microbiome contributing to um, potential resistance to pathogenic viruses? Exactly. Um, so what they did is uh, they took basically they took Hippocytorus armiger. So just to give you guys context on this bat species, uh, Hippocytorus armiger is a is the bat that they chose. It's a, a Hippocytorus bat, which is in the same super family as the Rhinolophus bats. So the horseshoe bats that are defined reservoirs of different coronaviruses like uh, RATG13 has been defined in um, in these horseshoe bats. Also, uh, the banal viruses that were found in Laos uh, last year, those are also, or is it this year? Was it 2022? Yes, it was, I believe. Um, they were also found in these bat species. Um, so they're, to give some in, insight on the bats, they're insectivorous. They also, they echolocate. Um, they are found in woodland caves, trees, typical places that you find bats. Um, they're all across Southeast Asia, but also in China, Nepal, India, 
and um, and these bats actually roost with, so I should say that this is important. So Hippocideris species, this Hippocideris armiger actually roosts with uh, Rhinolophus species, which obviously increases the, the um, probability of viral mixing. So between, um, between these bats and uh, yeah, so I will explain the so, control. So I'm, basically, I'm, they took... I'm actually really glad that you Sorry. mentioned all of that because that was going to be my <laughs> biggest question was um, sort of the choice of Hippocideris um, and how you felt about that. Um, I could certainly imagine, for example, that a fruit bat would have a different microbiome than an insectivorous bat. Um, and so I, that was my biggest question. So Thank you for pointing out the similarities to rhinolophus. And now we know how to pronounce hippocideris too. That's right. So now I have a hippocideris yeah, yeah. question for you. Is it a nocturnal <laughs> feeder or a daytime feeder? I believe they're nocturnal. Nocturnal. It's yeah. an insectivorous? Yeah. All right. So the fruit bats, would they don't have to worry about um, their food source emerging after the sun goes down. So there <laughs> might be more contact than between those bats, the, noct the non-nocturnal feeding bats and people. Hmm. That's all I'm raising the question for them. True. Mm -hmm. So there's more of an ecological connection between mm -hmm. day feeding bats and uh, nocturnal bats. Uh, well, also, yeah, there are many factors. Also, I think Vincent mentioned this, um, that they also talked about at the, at the symposium where fruit eating bats also well, obviously they're feeding during the day, but they also eat fruit and then spit it out. And then that fruit is sitting on the yeah, ground yeah. where mm -hmm. then people walk right, by right, and other right, animals right. walk by. The pulp is left behind. Like they basically suck out all the juice and then just like expose of the fibrous, um, which is obviously in the salivary glands, many viruses um, are in the salivary glands. So the, their, their saliva could be potentially full of different, potentially uh, zoonotic viruses. So, uh, yeah, so that's why. Also, they chose Hippocidus armiger, I should say, because they've also been infected. They've seen them with uh, orthomyxoviruses, so they've seen like flu viruses uh, in these bats, and they also have high levels of uh, firmicutes and proteobacteria, like other insectivorous bats. So they wanted to choose a species that was representative of insectivorous bats, like the microbiome, at least to some extent. Um, so they had four groups. Um, basically, they had three control groups. They had, um, I don't know how going to too many details, but basically the, the important ones we're going to say is that they had, um, so they gave the mice antibiotics. So when the mouse were, the mice were weaned at three weeks, they depleted their microbiome with an antibiotic cocktail. And then uh, gave them either, let's call it, we're going to call it FMT, so fecal um, microbiome transplant. They gave them an FMT for three days orally, which um, it's kind of gross, but yeah, they, they literally gave they them- They fed like them fecal, guano, yes. Yes, they fed them they, they slurry. Did. Let's call it a fecal slurry. Fecal Is that slurry, oh, that sounds even slurry. more appetizing. That's even, yes. that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> a little graphic, but I like, I like the, yeah. Um, so they gave, they had two groups. They had mice that were given uh, a murine fecal slurry. So a mouse fecal slurry. And then the, also the bat fecal slurry. Uh, and then they also had mice that were just given PBS and then mice that weren't depleted and just on PBS. And um, all of the mice gave a one-star review for this restaurant. Well, I will <laughs> mice are coprophagic. They are, yes, that is yeah. true. True. Um, also importantly, they, they spun down the feces. So they resuspended them and then spun them down and then removed the majority of the viruses. So they removed the supernatant, um, just so like they say that they removed all the viruses, which I don't know if I'd agree with they removing all of them, but they would remove a large majority that was in the supernatant at least. Um, right. Cause they don't want to transfer a bunch of unknown bat viruses into the mice that they're doing True. this with but how did but he, how did how did they know that the microbiome of bats would be compatible with mice considering the difference in their body temperatures and the fluctuations in bats that does not occur in mice how would you know that the physiology would say oh yeah we could just they did the experiment it's, we used to call them transphonations right they did the experiment yeah but how many of the 
how many species of bat uh, bacteria are there in mm -hmm. bat feces? Well, so there's so this ours is 1500, right? right? There's 1500 different. At least, at least. At so least. that's the thing is that is that obviously um, I just want to add this as like a, an aside because bats are the closest species, closest mammalian species to bats. I want, can you guys guess what it is? I don't think, maybe Vincent knows, but it's so random. You will never guess this. Evolutionary Ant eaters. Okay, no. <laughs> Shrews. So, no. How many guesses? It's not a rodent. <laughs> it's not a rodent. So horses are the closest horses. horses. Yes. Get out of here. You mean yes. Pegasus was real? <laughs> the closest your, your would know that. Your relatives would know of bats that. are horses. Okay. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. And wow. yes, they, they are. So, so part of like the Perisodactyla are the closest. So horses are in Perisodactyla. So even toad ungulates um, and hmm. sorry, odd toad ungulates, I should say. Uh, and Rodentia, which what, what mice are in is actually extremely distant evolutionarily, extremely. Mm -hmm. um, humans are actually closer to, to, to bats than mice are to bats. So, so obviously why do, that's why like do you why do you know this? Do they teach you this in veterinary school? All this species. So my Judith, so my my supervisor actually we've spoken about this before because we talk about bats all the time. Yeah. And she had in her review actually that she wrote they have like a the taxonomy of bats and then they have like the most recent uh, I guess evolutionarily extant group and it's and it's okay. horses like it's like right. a goose. And when I saw that I was like horses yeah, and then she explained this that. to me no i so, figured it had to be a carnivore which is why i picked shrews because they're kind of you know mm -hmm. like bats that don't fly but no not really do bats have a common ancestor or were there multiple times that bats arose i don't know i feel like there must be multiple but i'm not actually sure like evolutionarily because they're so there's like yeah, well and define right, define you know, bat uh, at what point on the tree do you say this is a distinctly a bat? When it can fly. Okay, so did flying mammals evolve multiple times is, mm -hmm. is the question then. That is, that is but, correct. I'll rephrase uh, that. I'll well, rephrase. they <laughs> once, once, and then birds, and then dinosaurs. There's three different yeah. orders or whatever. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Angela, go ahead. So with that, I just want to say that obviously um, that's one of the – I guess caveats or that taking a microbiome from a very distant species, any interspecies fecal transplant or a microbiome transplant would, um, I guess I want to say cause an immune response. So that's the thing you're, you're giving all of these, all of these commensal potentially pathogenic, like all of these microorganisms that this mouse has never seen that's coming from a bat. Exactly. So a lot of, I feel like a lot of the findings are, artifact of that of that the bat is in a or sorry the mouse is in an inflammatory state or an inactive immune response to the microbiome itself because they're not on mm -hmm. immunosuppressive drugs obviously they're not modulating the immune response so a lot of it i feel like is is contributing to that but i guess we can talk about it um let's just i'm getting ahead of myself so uh the first figure is just showing that overall the um diversity in the in the chiropteran, so the bat microbiome is less than that of mice. So they show um, just in general that there's there's less overall microbial diversity. Uh, and also in figure, so this is figure one. And if those of you that have um, access to the figures E, you can see figure one E, um, they're showing like the different uh, after 16S uh, sequencing, you can see the bat microbiome has all of these lactococcus that they say in the paper that when they seed, when they reconstitute these mice with the microbiome, that it looks similar to the murine microbiome, which I don't really agree with that statement, because if you look at it, it looks like so the ABX M14 are the mice that have been seeded with mouse microbiome, and then the ABX B are those that have been seeded with bat, and then there's day seven and day 14. Uh, and if you look at day 14, even day seven, like there's no lactococcus, yeah. there's no, and then there's this proliferation of, it looks more similar to the mouse microbiome actually. Um, and I feel like also 
they don't say they didn't give any sort of gastric protector. So a lot of these microorganisms would have been lost in the, in the stomach, because obviously we know the stomach pH is like one or two. And when people do do fecal transplants, a lot of the time they have enteric coatings and things like that, or probiotics, because if not, then you're going through the stomach and the stomach will destroy many, many uh, microorganisms. So I have, so, a, I have a question just briefly. Why didn't they use germ-free mice to begin with? I don't know because when we hypothesized, when we talked about, like we were toying with the idea, we were going to use germ-free mice. Um, so I don't know if they just didn't have access to germ-free mice because they're very expensive and you have to have a facility, obviously. And I'm not sure if that was part of it, but they don't, they don't explain. Not if you transphonate uh, them, you don't need a special trans. <laughs> you, you take them yeah. out of the isolator, right? <laughs> so the other thing is that you can do it transrectally too, right? So you don't have mm -hmm. to go through the stomach and then they can repopulate in that direction also. the only thing is that transrectal transplantation is normally isolated more to the distal digestive tract colonizing sure. all the way up the ileum to the duodenum isn't normally achieved because of peristalsis and the motion of the intestinal tract which literally goes towards the rectum you'd have yep. to have like anti-peristalsis to do so which is physiologically possible so there's this is true so People that have, I know humans that have transplants that are from the rectum, a lot of it is only in like the descending colon and in the rectum. It doesn't actually make it all the way up to the stomach. Yeah, that's, right, um, that's right. That's right. Dixon, the correct yeah. scientific term is repopulate. <laughs> Thank you. And by the way, Alan, do you know where the bats first arose? In Botswana. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, oh, good. You, you guys are really picking it up here. I, I like see, this. see, well, I'm actually reading about where the bats arose and the fact that they do seem to be monophyletic and have a single origin of flight. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> I'm reading that one. I, I kind of suspected that that was going to be something that arose once because it once either... it happened, then they radiated into all of yeah. the appropriate right. niches. Same with birds. Rose yeah. once, radiated out. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Angela, take it. So further. I'm glad to hear your analysis of all of that, because I looked at That's that good. figure 1E and I thought, eh. yeah, well, so we're, yeah. we're actually talking about figure two, if anybody's following along this. this oh, yeah, um, figure two. Sorry, although figure two. a lot of folks in our audience um, probably aren't. Oh, sorry. It's, right. it's not an yeah. open access paper, but yeah. it is an interesting paper to talk about. It so did. It about. did. Uh, the the uh, mice repopulated with bat stuff didn't look like bats to me you know, right. they looked more like mice so i think well a lot of the time with like bat research specifically there's um because it's also novel like all of it is really interesting but obviously certain things could have been more um ideal but i mean i think the question in itself and and the question of like if the microbiome itself could be modulating the immune response is interesting um but obviously there are all papers have you know limitations. Yeah, I, I, I agree um, completely i mean i'm not i'm not yeah. i'm not knocking the experiments necessarily it wasn't their fault okay right. the oh, experiments were the experiments yeah. worth doing you know? yeah and i think that you have to do this experiment before you do the germ-free experiment just because of the expense of the germ-free experiment and what would happen if say you repopulated the germ-free mice and they all died right well you could obviously collaborate with a group that has germ-free sure. animals already <laughs> like right but the there's university. still somebody's still got to pay for them yeah no, and i understand but the answers that you're going to get are really worth paying for oh of course yeah yeah, but I mean, to Brianne's point, it's good to do this in a cheaper system first. I understand. Uh, make sure that the bat microbiome is not instantly lethal to mice, which was a possibility before or, this. Or, or make sure that it wasn't just absolutely a non-starter, not at all interesting. Right, right. If it ended up looking exactly like the mouse microbiome once you got it into the mice, then that would be... Yeah. The other question I would have, since I'm in my early days of graduate work, I worked on germ-free mice and obviously I have a, a propensity towards that model. Um, how are you sure all of the microbiome of the mice that were transformated, as they used to call it, uh, are bat origins only? Are you sure you wiped out everything with the antibiotics? Or did some of those hiding in the crypts actually come back out again and repopulate with mouse microbiome as well? 
think definitely some. I know that they said that they flushed after the antibiotic treatment with uh, glycerol to try to, of course, but it, you're, it's definitely <laughs> in the group. I think that there would be um, microorganisms that could be in there for sure. Right. So that, yeah. another reason for wanting to use germ-free animals, you're sure of what you're starting with. There's yeah. not going to be any question at all about what's happened. And then you can normalize them by just taking them out of the incubator after you transfer it them. So Angela, we um, need to move quickly here, more quickly. So yes. uh, can you summarize so, what they found? Um, yeah, so um, basically they saw that uh, that there were certain immune cell populations, um, like certain T cells seem to be increased in, in the, uh, so wait, this is figure three. Let me just make sure. Cause the first figure was the experimental design. Yeah. Figure three. Um, they see that there were also reconstituting. So once, um, they give this fecal mouse transplant then they, or, or bat transplant, and then they wait a few days. And then I think this is day seven, um, they look at the immune cell populations in the spleen and in the mesenteric lymph node. So they harvest those and then they look at the cells and basically they're just seeing that, um, they set, let's see, CD3 positive. So CD4 T cells were increased on day 14. Um, I don't know if there's anything. So I think that all of these immune cells that they see that are like increased in the bats or lower, I'm not going to go into the details. I think that it's part of, uh, in the, the ones that were given bats, just part of an, an immune response to the microbiome itself. Yeah, I right. don't know if any of it is that interesting or if it is that um, specifically like from the bat microbiome that's modulating the mouse immune system in a different way. Like apart from the fact that it's a, a slew of uh, exogenous microorganisms that this, or I should say like, foreign microorganisms that this mouse's immune system has never seen. Um, so, so that's what about the immune cells. I yeah. don't think the immune cells were yeah. that interesting. They saw an increased TNF alpha in the antibiotic bat mice. I also think it's part of the, this active immune response from the microbiome itself. Um, and then they, I'm like skipping ahead a few figures because yeah. a lot of that was test. They measured cytokines in serum and in, um, None of the cytokines were increased necessarily compared to, I think it was only, yeah, TNF alpha. And by the um, way, they, they did not look at the spleen. They looked at the sulpine. Yeah, I, I noticed know. that too. I a, gonna... It is a perfectly wow. consistent typo through all of the figures mm -hmm. I've had it. I mean, as somebody who was... suffers from proofreader's eye, this just leapt out at me. Yep, and I yep. thought I'd mention. <laughs> Yeah, when I saw that, I was I was going to mention it now, and then I was like, maybe I should. And then no, I was thinking, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. And I was like, no, I gotta say it. And they <laughs> copied right. and pasted it throughout the entire it, manuscript. Well, yeah, I mean, they probably just let it through. Yeah, it's the the standard Slip, graph slipping. that they made yeah. just had that misspelled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Uh it, it it would be kind of nice if they had you know an additional group where they were looking at some other foreign microbiome put in yes. so that you can exactly. see is this back microbiome transfer, specific or transfer is this, of dog microbiome or a horse microbiome or something or, or even the, like wild mice microbiome or yeah even just a little I bit was, different. Yeah. yeah we spoke about this so i was talking with my yeah. pi and she literally said the exact same thing brianne she was like no we need another group and mm -hmm. i was thinking of ferret because it's a mustelid it's not in sure. rodents and it's not chiroptera so it's and that's it's good. a model mm -hmm. that we could have like a laboratory model yeah. that's available so it would have been nice to see that because then you could just say okay then it's not bat specific or it is bat specific or it's just this right. immune response right. to any other species that's not mouse <laughs> so, so the uh, the most common one that i I can think of as human to mouse. I mean, mm -hmm. that in the early days of knowing whether or not obesity was caused by microbiome or not, they were taking microbiomes from obese people into people mm -hmm. who would never gain weight and put them into these mice. And the mice that uh, got them from the obese people became obese mice. And uh, yep. that was the start of everybody. Well, maybe that's having an effect on everything in the body, not just how you look, but also how you, how you feel. Yeah. yeah. So then uh, to get back to the paper, because I know Vincent said we have not as much time. So right. then they saw that 
they infected the mice. So they, they infected the mice with um, H1N1. So PR8, which is a, the, the influenza virus that most of us use in the lab that infects mice really well. So, and they saw that the antibiotic depleted bat microbiome mice um, had minimal weight loss and no death when compared to the other groups. Um, and that the viral load was lower in these mice and there was less inflammatory cell infiltration. Um, but once again, I don't know, I don't know what, what you guys think, but I think that also like the TNF alpha that's increased could also be part of this. Mm. And then the, the fact that you're already in like a, it could be like a protective inflammatory state where your body's like kind of has like an immune readiness already yeah, sure. in these bats because they're, 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 I don't want like, yes, they're, cause this is only, I think 14 days or seven days after how many days is it after we, let me just check. Um, oh, how, how long after the transfer did they do the infection? Yeah. Um, the infection was virus challenge day 24, day 24. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And then they look at, so day 24, but they look at the, um, how many days is it? I think after days post-infection, there's no death. So the first mice start dying on day eight, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it's all around like the viral kinetics of influenza and that it could just be, I don't know if it's artifact to say, but the fact that the immune system is already primed, I guess. I don't know if primed yeah. is the right word. I was, yeah, or, I was or even just activated. Right. Yeah. I, I, I thought, oh, wow, it's a prime boost strategy there. <laughs> <laughs> so how could you get around that? If you really want to know if the microbiome matters, how would you do it in a way that doesn't have this issue? Great or, is question. It not, or is it not possible? I mean, let's say you let these mice go for a year. Would the bat microbiome remain? Great and there would be less immune activation by then. It would get used to it or whatever. Would that, or is it replaced by the few uh, mouse bacteria? Well, I think it would just become the mouse microbiome because yeah. it's in a mouse environment, right? So it's eating mouse food. It's in the 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 bedding. It would just adapt to the the environment that it's in, which is how it's established in the first right. place, right? So right. I think right. so even all as bat, is, well, the bat bacteria would be gone eventually. Right? Yeah, I think this is yeah. again where having another control foreign microbiome is important because then you could actually see the difference between the bat specific microbiome yeah, changes yeah. versus just activated immune system by all of this foreign set of uh, bacteria. Yeah. The virus challenge was initiated 14 days after transplant. Okay. Mm. So yeah, you, it's really and inconclusive, although they like to say there were some gut metabolites that were mediating this effect but in your mind it's really not possible to say there's any effect of the bat microbiome on resistance to influenza virus right yeah because then they go into certain metabolites which i then did some investigating um so they were talking about uh, tryptophan and uh, glutamine and then glutamate and how these could have antiviral effects and they've yeah. seen antiviral effects in other uh, models. But then I also really just went in into PubMed and I was like metabolome, influenza, H1N1. And I found a paper that was actually um, interesting that was on so uh, influenza infection, but it was in the lung and in, in mice. And mm -hmm. they also saw that influenza infection increased tryptophan and L-glutamine. So I was like, or L-glutamine, uh, 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 was it D-glutamate, I think? Sorry, I don't have it open. But I think um, they saw the same, um, the same metabolites produced. And this was in the lung in a mouse post-influenza. So I don't know if we could say that it's that specific or which obviously this is a completely different model but i mean i thought it was just interesting just metabolome and then we also saw these um yeah, yeah. these things so i don't know but i think it's still it's maybe still we should maybe we should bats. take the mouse microbiome and transplant it into bats <laughs> well you need germ-free yeah. bats yeah we don't <laughs> uh... i understand but then if uh if, if it gets worse, it's not an immune activation issue, right? <laughs> right. Or or maybe you take the mouse microbiome and the 
bat microbiome and put them both into rats <laughs> or ferrets okay. or something. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It would have been well, nice to see other viruses tried also. I yes. Mean, True. Just why pick on influenza virus? Well, well they've got a whole bunch it's, of. Them. It's an obvious choice. It will replicate. Well, I mean, it, it's got a good difference. I mean, there is an effect, right? Yeah. The yeah, weight loss is clear. There's no death. In we the, don't. We don't know what's causing the effect, but there is definitely an there's effect. There's an effect. Well, yeah. And and we know that these bats actually are infected with influenza. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Or can be infected yes. with influenza. Yeah. Airy orthomyxo. Yeah. Viruses. Yeah. So what's a virus that always kills mice? Um, uh, LTMV, close LTMV. I'll see what I say. So try that one next and see what happens there. I think that's what I would do. Although, if you infect young mice with LCMV, they get tolerized, right? This is true. This is very. Then true. you have to add T cells from immunized mice, and then they die. So it's it complicated. Gets complicated. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't always kill them. Hey, complex yeah, think, systems. You're in the so right department. My take on this was this. This was a. A tantalizing paper. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I was really glad to see somebody asking the question. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. What is the microbiome doing to protect bats against these viruses that are bad for other mammals? Yeah. Um, and this is mm -hmm. kind of the direction you would go to ask that question. And it's just they don't, they don't have quite the tools and the experiments necessary to really right. grab onto that. Right. And, and that's not... Right. That's not a dig on the authors. It's just because right. yeah. so I right. can't think of, I can't think of how you would do it. Well, are you implying? All the we've dug up. Are you implying that um, there aren't a lot of labs that have both access to germ-free mice and a bat microbiome? <laughs> and so, oh, I, I, yeah, I mean, that, that, are you implying I, that I everyone doesn't have that, that in their back pocket? <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that in North America. Yeah. In North America, this would have to be BSL-3 or 4. In China, I'm not sure they didn't specify if it was BSL-3 or 4, but we would have to be BSL-3 or 4, which there's only one in Canada, BSL-4. So really? that's probably because not of the, happen. the fecal material from bats. Yeah. Huh. Nevertheless, I learned a lot from the discussion. Yeah. So thank yeah, you, absolutely. Angela. That was good. And yeah. obviously, you have some knowledge of things that we lack including how to pronounce uh, many species names <laughs> and I, I picked the second paper which i thought would interest you it also has to do with uh animals and this is a cell paper mm. primate hemorrhagic fever causing artery viruses are poised for spillover to humans and this is from uh well the first author is cody warren and then the last couple of authors Tony Goldberg from Wisconsin, who uh, I think has been on TWIV. J Jens Kuhn, of course, who has been on TWIV and writes to us a lot. And Sarah Sawyer, who has also been on TWIV. Um, and these are from, you know, Fort Detrick, um, University of Texas, Wisconsin, Madison, Ohio State, Fred Hutch, J&J, &J, and North Carolina State. And so, you know, we're all focusing on bat viruses as potentially dangerous but you know what there are a lot of other viruses in different species out there and the topic of this paper is simian hemorrhagic fever which is a disease caused by uh, a, a mem members of uh, artery viruses which is uh, part of the needle virale is the bigger is it a phylum it, which I contains think, the coronaviridae, right? I think it's an order. It's an order? It's an order. Oh, that's right, because yeah. it has multiple, uh, families multiple families beneath it. And one of them is coronaviridae, one of them is arteriviridae, and then there's there are others too. Actually, there's a picture here that it has. Well, we got the coronaviridae, the arteriviridae, uh, and uh, that's going to have today's virus and then roniviridae, mesoniviridae, and tobaniviridae. But the uh, simian hemorrhagic fever virus causes disease in, uh, in primates. Um, they have entered primate facilities by importation of wild African monkeys who are infected in the wild. They come into the facility. We don't know they're infected. And then they, they infect the, the monkeys. But we've never seen a human infection. Right. So it, it seems like... 
Sorry. <laughs> it seems like in old world monkeys, this is a subclinical or um, largely asymptomatic kind of thing that spreads around. And in new world monkeys, it can be very pathogenic. Yeah. Is that the, I don't know if that's universally true, but that seems to be the, the outbreaks that yeah. have been observed with it. Yeah, RTV viruses, there's actually no known, just like fun fact, RTV virus that infects humans. And the mm -hmm. most like known or broad one in, in the veterinary world are in, is like PRS, PEERS, which is the porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, which many people know. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only RTV virus I even know of, actually. That's when I saw this paper, I was like, oh, like PEERS. Here's another one. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Human infections have not been detected in these primate facilities. But in Africa, you know, where the primates are that are infected, we don't know because there's no serology test, <laughs> which and seems a, like a bad reason not to know, I would oh, think. Right. And, and in a primate facility is very different from the wild. I mean, you've got containment. You've got a lot of separation between the researchers, and they're probably even before we got all uptight about uh, these things, people would mask up and glove up to handle monkeys. So there was a yeah. certain amount of caution there. Um, but as they point out in the paper, there's there's a lot of contact between some of these monkey species yeah. and humans. And sometimes the, the monkeys sure. get aggressive. They're stealing food from people and biting getting up in their face and biting, biting people. And um, but we don't scratch. We don't have any way to know if that's spreading these viruses. So the... Right the, 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 the I'm sorry to interrupt. Are yeah, you yeah. happy with the word poised in this title? No, I, I don't not, think that's I don't think I'm that's a good word. No. It. I I think they can replicate in human cells. That's the punchline. That's but different. is that enough? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's a that's requirement, different. right? Unless you can replicate in human cells, right. okay. you'd never make it in, right. on Broadway. But um <laughs> Poised yeah, I don't think poised. I, I think I, I poised think, yeah. is a little bit too sensational for my yeah, that's liking. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. the the headline is a little over the top. Yeah. Thank you. I, th I thought so too. So the reservoir of this this virus, simian hemorrhagic fever viruses, uh, in in a vari variety of African monkeys, apparently healthy, multiple species. They have a lot of virus. As Alan said, they interact with people and they can scratch them. So. What's the potential for people to get infected? Um, the viruses can replicate in primary chimpanzee and gorilla cells, and they make a parallel with SIV, where the virus went from uh, old world monkeys into chimps and gorillas and eventually into people, right? So they say, hey, <laughs> maybe a similar thing could happen here. So maybe we should do some work. So uh, they think it's poised because, well, they're going to do the experiments that suggest it, but also there's no immunity in people, right? There's zero immunity, kind of like SARS-CoV-2, right? So if it did get in and had all the right features, it could be a problem. Wreak havoc. Uh, yes. Wreak havoc. As we've seen. <laughs> so the... Um, now, I, I didn't see this <laughs> answered in the question. How, or do we know how SS, SHFV spreads in monkeys in its normal host i didn't, didn't see anything say, about that in the paper didn't it say urine or did i make that did up? it um <laughs> i hope not <laughs> i hope we didn't make it i don't know i don't know that's a good question i didn't come across that so there's a lot of possibilities right yeah and and i'm you know sp thinking about of course the spill this poised spillover um which species in particular have this virus and are they species that we see a far fair number of interactions with yeah the only uh, urine i'm finding the papers in murine so i saw it too actually <laughs> i read it the other thing i was thinking also is that what if a human being did become infected with one of these uh hemorrhagic fever causing viruses What's to say that they can now go ahead and transmit that to another human being? Well, right. That's why right. I was curious. Oh, yeah, of how course. It, and right. that's really, that's, again, that's a sensationalistic uh, Well, title. right. So, that, so again, I was I was wondering how it spreads among the monkeys because that might give some clue right. as to how it might spread right. says, to uh, apes. So I found a paper says the virus is typically transmitted between African non-human primates during fighting. Ah, but can spread efficiently among macaques by both direct and indirect contact. So the macaques in the lab, right? Fighting. Hmm. Interesting yeah, question. Yeah, aerosol as well, right? <clears throat> Could be. Also, it says here, like a 
reference from 1990, but even so, uh, via aerosol infected fomites or direct okay. contact. So the results, I, I have to point out the first sentence of the results I, I think love is this. very funny. <laughs> yes. Most simian artery viruses remain uncultured. I don't even want to talk about them if they're uncultured. Yes. Do you? Right. They never go they haven't to the been opera. the opera. They swear a lot. <laughs> and then they say the few cultured ones are finicky. <laughs> they only like a couple operas. They're picky yes. eaters are picky eaters. <laughs> finicky. That's an interesting word applied to finicky. a virus. Replicating in only a handful of non-human primate cell lines. That's what they mean by that. So SHFV, simian hemorrhagic fever virus, which is the topic of this paper, it was first cultured during this outbreak among captive rhesus macaques at an NIH primate unit in Bethesda, Maryland. And they say it presumably got to them through uh, African monkeys, patas monkeys that were co-housed at this facility. And that was 1968. So 1968. despite these... Uh, these um, uh, viruses being uncultured and finicky, they managed to culture them in 1968. Now, here's some, some important information. The virus can only be grown to high titers on grivet, on a grivet cell line called MA-104. I love it. They're actually not just going with African greens, but they're actually distinguishing between grivets and vervets. Right. Wait, but what's, what's they do grivet? say what's that grivet stop right there. What is it, a grivet? It's is it one of the types of monkeys that is an African green monkey, as is the vervet. Very specific. It's yes. a subspecies or a variety or no, a... it's a particular species. It turns out African green is many species. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So we're gonna be more specific than that. Grivets. So the Vero cell line is a grivet cell line. Grivet. But they yes. point out that um they're not permissive to this virus and that's the right word means the virus could get in but it doesn't reproduce inside the cell so ma104 uh, and other derivatives will grow this virus okay so the first step is they want to identify the receptor and they have some previous evidence that antibodies against cd163 a cell protein can impede infection. So they make, they take these MA104 cells, they knock out the gene for CD103 that reduces virus production. They put the gene back in, it restores it. Um, interestingly, so they think this means that CD163 uh, is, uh, and if they put CD163 into Vero cells, now those cells can be infected. Skin cells from two different patas monkeys, which are the presumed natural host, actually don't get infected. They don't have CD163 and they don't get infected. So they're not where the virus is reproducing in the monkeys, clearly. Mm. Uh, and they can also put viral genomes into cells that uh, don't have CD163 and show that you can launch a viral reproduction cycle. So it looks like CD163 is a receptor. However, it is not a plasma membrane receptor. It's an intracellular receptor, you know, like the Ebola virus receptor, which is the NPC1 protein, the neiman pick cholesterol transporter protein inside the endosome. Lassa virus, Lujo virus uh, receptors are also intracellularly. So somehow the virus particles get in and then within the endosome, they hit a receptor and then that triggers entry. Uh, and, did they say, Vincent, if um, if this virus, like viral replication, I know that they did imaging, but did they actually do any sort of infectivity assay to see if the virus was even, like, did they do anything with the cells afterwards to know if it was actually infectious virus? They just they saw put the gene. You mean virus. if they put the genome in only or what? Which, no, which like one? after they saw maybe i'm mistaken after they saw replication in the cells didn't the image and show let me see well all of their growth curves and stuff are plaque assays yeah they, oh, they certainly know. make they're getting virus virus. Out the but what you're you these are all pop what cells are these on ah yeah yeah yeah. never mind yeah, the ma104 is probably measured it in itself sorry i was but they do you know they do rna in c2 assays to look at where uh, the virus is infecting in the cell, right? They do fish. Okay, yeah. Single molecule fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they go fishing, but they can see 
puncta, viral RNA puncta, both inside uh, set wild type MAs and, and lacking CD163 after exposure. So in other words, a virus somehow can get in even without CD163, but without CD163, it does not reproduce. You don't get RNA puncta in this cell, uh, but with okay. CD163, you do. So that's that's really nice evidence that uh, CD163 is an intracellular receptor for the mm -hmm. virus. All right, so CD163 in these uh, non-human primate cells appears to be the receptor for the virus. So now, what if you look at different primate CD163 genes, right? So they talk about the virus host conflict. You know, if a, if a virus is binding to a host protein over evolutionary time, the host protein will change to avoid virus and then the virus changes back. We have this virus host conflict, it's called, right? And you can look at the sequences of different orthologs of CD163 and look for signs of positive selection on certain residues, that certain residues are changing in response to virus pressure, right? And that's easy to do because they have sequences of all these CD163s. And then they, they say, okay, we can see signs of positive selection in parts of CD163, but let's actually do the experiment. They take... Uh, MA104 lacking CD163, and they put the gene for one of 15 different primate species CD163s into them. And then they ask, can they be infected with SHFV? Okay, so if you do that with the Patas monkey CD163, yeah, the cells get infected really well. But with the others, they get different amounts of uh, infectability using CD163s from other uh, species, three orders of magnitude in, uh, in difference. It's a really nice experiment. Very nice I experiment. I think one mm -hmm. of them was macaque CD163, the ones that were infected in the primate facility. Their CD163 works pretty well. So that's good. It's consistent with that. Um, and so um, they found also that ape CD163 works, hum, uh, chimp, gorilla, and human mm. CD163 work to support uh, SHFV replication in these MA104 cells. Three great apes, yep. But what about the whole cycle in human cells, right? <laughs> With that, and that's the punchline, right? So they take um, th uh, monocytes, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from three different donors, and they differentiate them uh, into different kinds of macrophages, and they don't they don't get infected. Um, so instead of differentiating them, they they took human monocytes cell lines which represent the lineage prior to differentiation from what they got from people. And they can be infected with SHAV. They make infectious virus. So human cells, they have a receptor that works. The virus gets in, it reproduces, goes through the whole cycle, it makes infectious virus. That's uh, these monocyte cell lines. Then they look at a some members of a human uh, cancer cell panel uh, which are available, and they f select four cell lines, and they found a human kidney epithelial cell line that supports replication uh, of the virus. It grows to 10 to the seventh infectious virus particles per mil. Um, and th th what they say, which is a little intimidating, they say these cells are interferon competent. They're not like deleted for interferon genes like Vero cells. So the virus can reproduce well in the presence of uh, an intact interferon. And they suggest that maybe they bypass interferon pathways. So I'm a little confused. Yep. Uh, because of this uh, difference in uh, host range and culture. Um, uh, I need clarified where CD163 is normally expressed. Okay, I think I know, but I want to hear from you guys where it's normally expressed, what the pathogenesis of the virus is in its natural host, what tissues it infects, and how that is relevant 
to the various cultured cells that they're yeah. using. Yeah. So I also had a lot of thoughts uh, relative to this, these exact questions, Rich, um, because I was surprised that the first types of cells that they were using in terms of human cells were monocytes and macrophages. Um, I, I didn't, while those happen to be cells I like to think about, um, they are not often this, the sort of first go-to um, if you think about virus infection and if you think about transmission, um, the first cell a virus is going to encounter is likely not a monocyte or macrophage. Um, but they note here that CD163 is particularly well expressed in monocytes and macrophages. But and not so, exclusively, right? Not exclusively. Okay. Um, they, they say specifically in myeloid cells, but from the data that I've seen, it is not exclusive. Okay. Uh, and so they picked those cells because they are um, cells that are expressing a lot of CD163. Um, and they also point out that the um, uh, porcine virus um, that Angela mentioned um, replicates in myeloid cells, as do um, some other related viruses. But they point out very well here, and I think this is this was my biggest question on this whole uh, yeah. paper, was that they don't actually know um, what is the typical uh, location of replication of this virus in the apes. Okay. And so they they picked these cells because of CD163 and because of the replication in macrophages um, in other cell or in other viruses. But they specifically, I'm scrolling and not finding it right now. Um, so I have a paper about the pathogenesis of uh, SHFV, and they say <laughs> it reproduces in dendritic cells and macrophages in, in infected uh, non-human primates. You know, the, the macaque, mm -hmm. for example, in the lab where they can do that. I don't know about right. the, the natural reservoir in Africa, What if it's the same yeah. or different, yeah. Yeah, they find further studies on the exact cells that replicate simian needed, arterial yeah. viruses are needed. Although tissue embedded uh, subsets are notoriously difficult based on uncertainties, we did a different approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, in the end, they find a human cell, but, you know, I don't what whether the, that would be relevant to human disease, right? right? Okay, so it's fine. not clear. Uh, so what I'm that's hearing why poised is I was okay is, to be yes. I was okay to be confused. Yep. No, it's fine. It's I poised is too strong because there are yeah. a lot of ifs. There's a lot of unknowns right. here, right? Um, I bet you could find a lot of similar viruses who have who fit these criteria. You could find a human cell line that they reproduce in right um so that, that's uh, that's the story and we don't know i think the key here is we don't know if people in africa are subclinically infected um if, whether any disease is caused remember it took many years after siv jumped into people to find the disease because it was kind of mushed in the whole background of disease in africa mm -hmm. right so there could be disease going on there. And so they say we need serology tests. And I think that's a good idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I really yes. like that. That's one of the best parts of the whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it takes a paper like this, I guess, to provide the impetus to uh, to do this, right? To say, oh, let's just, do, it's easy to develop a serology test and let's go look. So Right. And maybe and it'll you, provide impetus to answer some of these other questions we've pointed out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so, you may have to write poised for spillover into the title to get people interested. To get people's attention. That's that could obviously be. why that's that being could be. Done, I think. Maybe, so you know, it does catch your attention. Like in preventative medicine, as you guys were saying, to prevent would definitely save possibly millions of dollars in the future if something yes. actually yeah. causes. So we, we don't seem to be big on prevention. We wait and then we try and catch up, right? Mm -hmm. This is the story of public health for its entire history. So yeah. even after COVID, I would bet we didn't learn anything. We're going to do the same stuff. I was just reading through um yeah cuz I had before we interviewed David Quammen. Quammen, yeah. Earlier in the week. He has all those 95 bios of the people that he interviewed. Yeah. Yeah. And and I hadn't I saw him but I didn't pay too much attention. I started reading him today. And I believe it's Christian Anderson's interview that at the end he said he asked him whether as a result of all this we would 
uh, be better prepared for the next time around. And yeah. Andrew said something, something to the effect of, um, the answer to that would be no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's not optimistic. I think he mentioned I, that. I have been asking he, public he health people this for uh, every yeah. time there's some burst in, in funding, even before uh, SARS-CoV-2. You know, this would come up and, and oh, Ebola, you know, and there'd be some burst of activity on it or um, H1N1 flu. You know, we had a we had a round of, oh, my gosh, we got to be ready for the next pandemic. Um, and then that petered out. And yeah. since yeah. since 2020, you know, talking to people, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, we've got all this, these projects, these projects. And and I always ask, um, how long do you think this is going to last? And then that's when you get to the well well it seems uh, to me that a, a, a really difficult uh issue is uh you know how do you prepare obviously this is one way which is by um understanding what the biosphere is and where the potential for spillovers might be and what the ecological changes are that can precipitate this and be aware of that and even focus on um individual potential you know high risk uh spillovers but there's also got to be some more i guess public health oriented yeah things that are more broad spectrum that no matter where it happens or how it happens we got to have ppe okay and 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 we got to have quarantine procedures and all sorts of other procedures in place it's a tough problem this is this is a systemic issue that's got to be handled in all areas of of policy um and yes we should we should be doing the one health type of approach of looking for stuff and trying to be ahead of the curve on that but we also need to have laws in place that will allow you know quarantine to be implemented and enforced that will in ensure in the <laughs> united states that we don't have 50 different sets of policies handled at state level you know, you gotta, you gotta handle this. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, with that. exactly. Um, you know, and this, these are things that are hard to put through, but we actually have examples from the pandemic. If you look to a place like South Korea or New Zealand, um, where they had a dramatic initial response because they had firsthand experience with SARS-1. Yeah, sure. And they built those systems and they proved that under the circumstances they can work when when the real one comes along you know actually seattle yeah, did a good job I, a, a lot of individual places in the u.s managed to do pretty yeah. good jobs but they were hamstrung by the fact that there was no coordinated federal response yeah. I, i'm gonna work on testing capacity yes um and i'm gonna work on anti making antivirals so that we have some stockpiled and i'm gonna plant some eucalyptus trees like Raina plowright's discussion <laughs> at the bat uh yeah. meeting about uh, thinking about the ecology and how we can make yeah. ecological. Try to prevent the, try to prevent the spillovers. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's even Eddie Holmes said, don't forget about cataloging. There's too many. Right. And by the time right. you're done, they're all changed that's right. anyway. That's right? right. That's right. But that's right. try to prevent spillovers. And I have one idea for preventing spillovers, which is pretty easy. Just don't sell animals in big cities that are imported. Uh, uh, uh. Not just in one place, but in many parts of the world where they do that. I mean, you can imagine in Africa, maybe there's a bushmeat trade with these primates oh, who are infected with there SFHV, is. right? Sure. There 100% yeah. is. Mm -hmm. I have so, seen things about it. Right. But then, then you get to issues of, okay, which parts of the culture do you sacrifice? Um, and is it okay to ban... Uh, what you're calling the bushmeat trade um, in some in South Africa or wherever you're you're deciding or Uganda, and yet say that it's still okay to hunt no, and eat no. venison in the U.S. Yeah. But you don't do that. Reina is her idea is you don't ban it. What you do is you install sentinel programs in areas of animal human interfaces and look for viruses going into people you develop assays yeah. that where you do serological surveys of people that are visiting various markets or doing bushmeat trade so that you might i think that's not a bad way because i i agree you can't just ban it all because people's lives 
depend. I mean, I would say that. Well, and also, what if I've you learned, ban it, then it just goes underground, and you can't monitor. That's what it happened all. in that China, cool. right? They, they banned it, and they it just kept happening. But let I me think, ask. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, there's some utility, I think, to virome sequencing, even though even if the viruses have changed by the time, let's say, a year has passed, but but at least you know if there are potentially pathogenic, let's say, coronaviruses or. Uh, Hendra viruses or et cetera in the population, just circulating within the population, not necessarily even just antibody. You can test the antibody levels to see just the viruses in general, like what family of viruses is circulating there to know if any of those could or potentially have spillover. Like in North America, where the virome of the bats has been very poorly identified, like they've, there've only been one or two studies in all of North America, where we think that our bats are, oh, our bats don't have coronaviruses. Well, they do, they have alpha coronaviruses, which up until now, none of them seem to be um, hmm. pathogenic to humans. But I feel like one of the best things from the pandemic, I know that many things, yeah, we'll probably do this again, but, at least from what I've seen in the general public, is that a lot of people now know that certain animals are carriers of pathogenic viruses that before people didn't even know. People never thought about bats as, at least like the general public, thought that bats are so dangerous or potentially so dangerous where people would go in spelunking into caves and literally sit under thousands of bats and there would be secretions of the bats all around them and never think, oh, maybe I, I could get really sick here. Or maybe now people are more aware, I think, of of potential reservoir hosts like bats and also primates. I mean, this paper is obviously talking about primates, which people know because of other viruses. But SARS-CoV-2, I think, has, has at least opens people's mind to also hand washing and transmission, which obviously with TWIV, that's helped a lot. But I mean, you guys explain a lot about aerosol transmission and you've had, I think, hundreds of TWIV episodes now talking about <laughs> if transmission or between ferrets or the different models that there are. And just nobody ever really thought about that before. The general population never thought about sitting in front of someone three meters away and that viruses could literally be flying into the room. Like my father had never even thought about that. When I explained that to him in the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, yeah, these are things that we know, but that the general population had never thought about. So that part I think is positive. Yeah. So the, I, after I, SARS-1, <laughs> you know, scientists went out and collected serum in the countryside around where the virus originated. And they find two to 3% of people are seropositive for bat derived coronas, right? Mm -hmm. We knew this, we knew people are getting infected. Nothing was done, nothing was done at all, right? So now if we go in Africa, we develop a diagnostic and we find in these areas where these reservoirs are located, two to 3% of people are seropositive. Do you really think it's gonna be any different? I, I do think that there's been a shift and I, I would agree with Angela that there's been a shift in public perception, which has led to a shift in political perception, at least in some quarters. Um, about the importance of of these types of findings, um, and I, and I think that there's an appreciation that yeah, you know, maybe we should throw a little more chump change toward people to to study these things. Um, and of course, as a virologist, I'm all in favor of these virome surveys because they're just really freaking cool. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> that's not the way you sell the grant when you go to yeah. Washington. If you're director of the NIH, you say, yeah. we're doing this because it's really freaking cool. I mean, that only works for NASA. Um, if you're the NIH, and you've got to have the link and say, OK, SARS-CoV-2 this is what you get when you don't pay attention to the viruses that are out of the environment. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we that's... may not we may not need the entire list of every single virus in the catalog, um, but work I'd like, like this to is, have it. Actually, I'd I, like I that. I mean, <laughs> I'd like. I don't I'd think like we ever it. could. It, it, right. Only identified like zero point zero zero five percent of the yeah. virus here. I think. But, <laughs> but remember, at the beginning of this paper, we were all like, "Oh." Let me tell you all the things we don't know about arteri viruses. Yes. We probably yeah. weren't going to be doing that surveillance and we weren't going to make that diagnostic test before work like this. So it is kind of useful to have the surveillance to start these things. Whether yes. we make anything of it is a separate field by the, problem. By the way, is uh, is this open access, Alan? Do you know? This paper is open access, yes. yes. So figure one is very nice. It shows you the range of these various uh, non-human primates that uh, harbor 
uh, yes. this virus. And mm -hmm. it goes from Central to Southern Africa, Cameroon, Uganda, Tanz Tanzania, Zambia, South Africa. Hey, I mean, uh, Brianne, you may be seropositive. Who knows? I may be. I go to a fair number of those places in South Africa. <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, it was a, it's an interesting paper. It's a lot it of fun. I really enjoyed it. And good science, good good virology in it. Yeah, as despite well. our quibbles with the title, we uh, <coughs> I, I with the word it was, it was a good paper. They, yes, the word got, poised. It, they got away with it, you know. If transmission is possible by taking photos of those vervets in South Africa, then it's very likely I'm still positive. <laughs> <laughs> photos. All right, time to do some picks. Dixon, what do you have for us? Well, <clears throat> I'm continuing on with my. Uh, my journey through the world of jazz and uh we're up to the last of the small groups i, I picked five uh big bands and now i've on my fifth small group uh and they're called art blakey and the jazz messengers a lot of you are probably familiar with art blakey um but his jazz messengers continues to change because as he aged well, a lot of his star players went out and formed groups of their own. Hmm. So people like Miles Davis and um, Earl Clue and a whole bunch of other people that, that are now known for their own um, groups began with Art Blakey. And so Art Blakey, um, this is his premier group right here that you're looking at. The one that had the most production and the most albums and the most popularity. And the Blues March, if you... Um, download this music and i know that vincent you're going to make this as the uh, sentinel pick um when you listen to this piece of music you will you'll want to get up and march and sing and uh, raise your hands and yell hallelujah etc it's a, a wonderful piece of music that arose as the result of the ecology that art blakey surrounded himself with with regards to his players and uh, this is my last pick for groups the next time we meet we will probably be discussing individual players uh trumpet trombone um at any rate i listened to art blakey as a college student i listened to him as a young adult and um and as a mature adult i should say and uh his music never grew old every time he would get an idea, he would add somebody else to the group to allow him to remain current. And he's one of the few people that actually had no ego whatsoever about who played with him as long as uh, it was good music that everybody uh, agreed, made a statement with regards to the advancement of uh, jazz. So this is a wonderful group. And I highly recommend them. This is the only one of your five I've never heard of. Really? Okay. So I'm well, not a jazz connoisseur, clearly. Yeah, but you're becoming one. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to now pick five individual jazz artists, right? I will pick by instrument next. And then okay. finally, 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 I'll let, I'll give people my um, heads up. You better be with me that day because you're going to really like the uh, last of the last picks. I will pick the goat. Now, you probably don't know what I mean by go. The greatest of all time. Oh, <laughs> got it, you got it, you got it. Greatest of all time, right? That we is a will... common term used in many fields. Uh, that's yes. right. So People we, say we Roger will... Federer is the goat. Yeah, I was going to say sports. That's exactly right, yeah. exactly right. Leo so, Messi, uh, goat. That, that's right. He just retired. That's, you got it. So <laughs> I will pick the goat in jazz, and I bet you a lot of you could already guess who that is, but it's a single person, and that person has done more to spread the word about jazz and virtually anybody else so who did you say uh angela was goat who did... leo messi okay yeah barcelona soccer yeah or cristiano ronaldo you could say either keep They're going uh, david baltimore you <laughs> you can make a, a so, short uh, very uh, impressive uh, list. angela i guess you're you're a <laughs> hockey fan right that's soccer soccer i know it's soccer but are oh. you a hockey fan uh, not really. It's because I lived in Spain for so long that okay. I kind of... And then she lost her Canadian talk. citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Now that I live here, I have to... I am kind of into it, but I definitely was more of the soccer world when I lived in Spain. Who would be the goat so... of hockey? Uh, Wayne, of hockey? Gretz Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky, definitely. So in his later years, he played for the Rangers, you know. 
Gretzky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, uh, the other Canadian great, what was his name? What's Messier. The Mark Messier. Mark Messier. He, I think he played for the He played Islanders. for the Rangers a lot. He played for well, see, so he played for the Rangers. Um, no, but there are other, I think you're talking about somebody else. Rocket Richard. Yeah. Anyway, I saw someone took me to a Ranger game years ago, and I saw Gretzky. Yep. And it was very clear. And it's amazing he actually scored so much because everyone was always pushing him around, you know. Yeah, don't leave out Bobby Orr, by the way. Bobby, Bobby Orr. Orr. Bobby Orr, I think, is, the, is actually who you meant. Probably. Now, there's another person, and I remember that that game, they were both playing on, on opposite teams. And yeah. The other one was the other great Canadian but I don't know who it is because I'm not a sports aficionado. So anyway. I only know Wayne Gretzky. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, Thank I think that's Jackson. the only hockey player I could actually name. Too. A... So I, I think that would qualify him as the goat that he's known outside. Priya, yeah. what do you have for us? Uh, so I have something that um, was inspired by the papers that we read today. Um, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, right. Um, I just read this other paper in the New York or this article in the New York Times, um, which is called Why Chimps and Gorillas Form Rainforest Friendships. Um, I think that the why is maybe not the ideal uh, phrasing in the title, but the general idea has always been that a lot of different primate species um, don't tend to interact and are sort of competitors um, in the wild. And this talks about some of the different observations about seeing troops of say chimps where there happens to be a gorilla baby hanging out with the the juvenile chimps or something like that mm. and the ways that a lot of these populations are interacting um and may not always be direct competitors they may be tolerating one another um and interacting in ways that we always uh, sort of assumed would never happen. And so when you look back at that uh, map where we were seeing all of the different species and their interactions or, or in and their uh, habitats, um, I think that we often don't think about whether they might be interacting with one another, whether it's sharing viruses or whether it's sharing anything else you can imagine. And these sorts of observations make it clear that they are interacting species more than we originally thought they were. And thus was the next big Disney film born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is, this is really yeah. cool. Yeah. Interesting. Very That's interesting. True. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, this is just uh, an amusing thing. Uh, it's a video called Fly Water FPV to New Depths. I had to look up. It's a, it's just a video from a drone. Okay. Yeah. But it's uh, special in that, at least in the opening sequences, it looks like the drone is actually entering the water and flying hmm. underwater. Is and it then the coming six out. Rich, is it the six minute video from YouTube yep. uploaded yeah. yep. by Blaster? Okay. Yeah. And um, so I had to look up uh, FPV. Oh, wow. to, uh, I had to look up first FPV person to, view. First person view, yes, which means that the pilot of the drone sees from the point of view of the drone. And of course, That's I dug incredible. around in that and got into all sorts of drone stuff that you know I could I can see how you could get into this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, at any rate, I thought it was amusing. Okay, and it starts off with. It starts off with just the pictures that you get from the drone, not only flying underwater, but through a different one, flying through a waterfall and that kind of stuff. And then it sort of backs off and gives you some more insight into the technology, how they actually do it. And it's quite cool. So, That's Rich, cool. I'm a fly fisherman, and wow. this is fly water. Yes. <laughs> There's no difference. I I would I love this. I absolutely love this. This is things wonderful. you can do with drones and photography are amazing. This yeah. is fabulous. And you can always see the drone shot in the movie or the TV yeah, show now, yeah, right? But yeah. this is underwater. That's very cool. This and, is and, remarkable. And actually, now that we're talking more generally about drones, have you see, ever seen one of these sort of uh, ersatz fireworks drone shows? No. Okay. Oh. Where they've got like hundreds of drones flying in formation at night. With oh, yes. Colors, videos of this. Oh, yes. You know? Yes, Amazing my, son, stuff. my son went to Burning Man and they had one. 
right. where each drone had a light and they had yeah. them all coordinated by some program yeah. that one of these guys wrote oh yeah. my god and it makes different figures yeah. in the sky amazing yes very amazing. cool that's cool that's cool that sounds so expensive to have that yes oh uh, yeah you, yes. where would you get that it's, it reminds me the thing of is, my, my other favorite song do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> close encounters of the third kind yes but not only so the drones if it's if there's wind they have to compensate right and yeah. a th thousand drones all at once have wow. to compensate it's wow. really the programming is actually amazing <laughs> It does that. Well, a lot of that is actually built into the drone programming itself. Um, yeah. You could just set them to hover, and they will. And if a breeze blows, they'll automatically compensate for it. And it's I, I have built to into the low-level programming of a lot of the drones. I have to wonder if in the programming, if all the drones don't know at least who their neighbors are and where they are. Oh, yeah. yeah. They've got it. They would okay. have to, for formation flying, they'd have to monitor okay. proximity and be aware Here, of where they I'm are. I'm going to paste. This is not wow. my pick, but I'm going to paste... <laughs> A link to the dr a thousand drones at Burning Man. Oh cool. my gosh! Oh yeah. Okay. It's just it's wow. you know guy is a f look at that uh, the stuff that they are doing and they show you kind of how they do it with all the drones on the ground right they get them all ready and stuff very cool. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? <laughs> I have uh, so I'm also linking to a video, but because this is a uh, G or PG rated show, I have to I have to preface it with a little warning. The video is perhaps not G or PG rated, and if you are easily perhaps? offended, if you are easily offended. Um, I will warn you. Um, so this is this is a famous routine by George right. Carlin that I was just recently reminded of. Um, Sometimes, so don't Oops. yeah don't <laughs> don't play that audio directly on the show. I literally um, was trying to mute it before that second time. I'm so the, sorry. The title of this <laughs> bit is is seven the seven words you can you can't say on television, right? Yeah. Um, and this is a this is a famous bit uh, for a few reasons. First of all, it is one of the most brilliant bits of comedy performance ever. And and the reason I link to a video of it that's not the entire routine is because the other examples of it I found online were just the audio. Um, and you really need to see Carlin's expressions and his delivery. And he's just he was a, an absolutely brilliant comedian. Um, this particular routine was also the subject of a Supreme Court case <laughs> because he performed it uh, on the radio in 1972, I think. And somebody took offense because he used the words you're not supposed to use on the radio. Mm. And it went to the Supreme Court, uh, which issued one of the uh, stupider decisions in the history of the Supreme Court um, that allowed the FCC to regulate uh, speech on radio and television. Um, but uh, but the bit is absolutely mm. brilliantly done. So. There you go. That similar thing happened to Lenny Bruce, right? He yeah. Well, in fact, Carlin, uh, Lenny Bruce was a huge influence on George Carlin. Uh, uh, George Carlin was a very standard kind of basic comedian, um, and uh, the, when Lenny Bruce was arrested, uh, the, he ended up protesting the arrest and getting thrown in the same squad car next to Lenny Bruce on the way to jail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and after that, he completely changed his routine and became the comedian huh. who he eventually became, who wow. did this. And I was just Googling Lenny Bruce because I have never heard of this person in my life. <laughs> that's really? really old school. Yes. <laughs> 1966. That's yeah. why. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a very sad because it ruined his career. Right? He was never the same afterwards. The best line he right. ever had was that um, he said, "You know what they're doing out there?" He said, "They're arresting people for um, homosexuality," and you know what they do? They throw them in jail with a bunch of other men. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, he got arrested. Right. Yeah, but okay. but uh, George Carlin, brilliant comedian, and this is one of his cool. all-time great routines. Cool. And I just actually I, I even, was reminded of it recently, and I said, "Oh, I've got to pick, pick that on Twitter." Anybody so who has Caleb, if that, you're sure. listening and you're old enough now, enjoy. Caleb is definitely <laughs> old enough to listen to this. 
there's actually a wiki <laughs> there's actually a wikipedia entry titled seven dirty words yes oh, that yeah. goes All goes right. through it in detail cool with a yep. link to each of the words yes. so you can understand what they mean <laughs> angela what do you have for us <laughs> Okay, so I chose the Inspiring Women's Women in Science Award from Nature. That was actually um, the awards were just given out on the 11th, so Tuesday. And so basically, um, it's this science award just um, celebrating and highlighting different women in STEM and um, those who work, obviously, like to encourage younger women to engage in STEM, different subjects and different STEM associated careers around the world. So the winner uh, for achievements, the scientific achievement was Kasmikia Corbett, which uh, many of us, I know you guys have spoken a lot about her on Twitter. She's an amazing yeah, no, hey, Wait a minute here, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> the she second winner in this contest looks very familiar. She was so, on, well, she was yeah, on she Twiv. Was. <laughs> she was on Twiv, yes. So I know what Dixon's saying, but she was on Twiv. So her work, her postdoctoral work, at um, the this VRC amazing. Congratulations. was obviously part of um, the the production of the mRNA vaccine and Moderna specifically, which her work was um, paramount in that. And then, of course, I needed to add this because my sister, Kiana Mingarelli, was actually the runner up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, a, that's incredible. Down. Great. She's... Yes, I, I noticed that. <laughs> So she's a gravitational wave astrophysicist, and she studies low frequency gravitational waves. And um, oh my yeah. gosh! So she was the runner up, which I was so proud of. Which even Absolutely. having her, I didn't even her. notice that. You know, it's funny. I was I was googling your name, and I kept coming up with Kiata instead yeah. of. And I said, "Who the, is, is her name? Actually, Kiata was your sister. Oh, that's my cool. sister. Yeah. Um, wow. So that a, was that was amazing. A so gravitational I, wave astrophysicist. Yeah. Where where is she at? Uh, where is she working? So she's uh, she has a in position at UConn, UConn at the University of Connecticut. Oh. She did uh, her her postdoctoral work. So she did her at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in um, in Pasadena. Absolutely. And then she also works. So she's working at UConn, but also at the Flatiron Institute uh, in New York. Would so. she like to come on TWIV and talk about black holes? Definitely, just gravitational waves. Her. She could give a lay. I would uh, love that. I would love to hear it. Oh, I'm sure she would love to. She's even more enthusiastic than me about my research, so she would. She would love that. Yeah, sure. I mean, was I know. When, when will we get the black hole virome? I was wondering. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. It sucks was it all she... in. We can't get it. We yeah. can, how are we gonna? It doesn't make it past the event horizon. We can't. <laughs> was she involved when the two neutron stars actually merged and the gravitational wave went out and they reoriented all their instruments to pick it up? I don't know. You'd have to ask her specifically. Um, but I know that they use so well she can explain all of this but they use to, to identify gravitational waves pulsars which are actually neutron stars so they're right. like the clocks right. of the universe which Indeed. Indeed. she loves to explain but i'm not sure if that event specifically i actually don't know i i'm uh, not going to say yes because then she'll kill me if i say yes if yeah. i get false information so, <laughs> so, if, if when we they had... say when they say did the earth move for you they really meant it <laughs> so if we have kiata on you you guys have to ask her questions, okay? Well, I'm ready. I, I I'm can ready. ask a question, but I want to understand the answer. And no, Rich, you, I'm sure I, Rich I, would I, ask right. questions. She'll make okay. it attainable. She's given many like talks and done podcasts with to lay audiences, where she loves she cool. loves all be fun. Of questions. Yeah, it'll be well, a lot of fun. Let's do it. Let's do I mean, it. I would learn. That's yeah. my motivation, right? Because <laughs> I sit with someone for an hour or so, and you ask them questions. That's a great way to learn. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, I that's totally cool. Agree. Thank you. you. UConn is in is in my neck of the woods. That's so actually kind of down the street, and not yeah. down the street, but it's it's a little way. Yeah, it is. It is stores. Nice stores. Yes, yeah. stores exactly. Yeah. I don't know, uh, Angela. In any other year, she probably would have won, right? Well, yeah, exactly. When I saw Kazmiki on the list, I was like, was yeah, she? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, obviously the other scientists are also amazing. But when I saw, obviously, I wanted my sister to win. But I kind of knew because Mikia was going to win, considering yeah. the work, which fair. So but, uh, she was in Canary Islands with you growing up, right? No, no, she actually went there. So we're seven children, and she's quite <laughs> a bit older than I am. And she actually, she was living, so she did her PhD in Birmingham. And I, when I moved there, she was in 
Italy still. She did like her master's in Italy, PhD in Birmingham, then went to Pasadena. So she never actually lived in, in the Canary Islands, but she came to visit me quite a few times. All right. What are the other five kids do? Tell me. <laughs> so the <laughs> eldest is Oliviana. She works in Oliviana. So obviously all Italian names. She works in a, a law firm. She does client services there. So business development and client services and one of the largest law firms in North America. And then my sister Chiara is the astrophysicist. Then my sister Giovanna has her own company. She, uh, it's called MC2, uh, Mingarelli and Co. Two, because uh, she has actually various companies. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she's actually in India right now. She went to India for various uh, work things. And then there's also Bernardo. So he's the one that studied Roman antiquities, and he's living in London. And his wife Ola also studied. Um, uh, she also studied anthropology, I believe. Uh, and then my brother Giordano in, studied international business. He's living in Poland. Um, my, where are we? Me, Angela, so <laughs> veterinary and PhD student. And then my youngest brother, Michelangelo, is actually living on the west coast of Canada. And he is a firefighter. So he does, uh, and he also does Red Cross on the ski hill. So like in the main, like in the west, obviously west, Canadian um he's ski oh. patrol cool he patrol exactly he does patrol and then he's also uh a firefighter there so and oh he's my also god your like parents fires, your so, parents yeah. did such a good job holy crap <laughs> I lost I lost count how many is that seven 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 holy and my god. yeah and my mom's a nurse and my father's a mathematician so wow. at, at Carleton University in Ottawa he's your age Vincent he's 69 and he also has no plans on retiring. He's like, I love teaching. I love every moment of teaching calculus. The engineers need me. <laughs> so very good. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Whew. Uh, I feel inadequate now. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from you, that's impossible. Everybody on this uh, podcast is amazing. None of you should feel that way. I, I mean, if for other reasons to having to do with <laughs> never mind That's how, how your kids have done oh. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yes but they're, they're all great my kids are great yeah <laughs> sure. uh my uh my pick so i'm doing five detective fiction writers that i really like so this is number four and this is the, the author is nevada bar and she, one of her protagonists is Anna Pigeon. So Anna Pigeon is a law enforcement ranger for the U.S. National Park Service. And each book is set in a different national park. And the themes are typically about murders that are committed in the parks. And Anna figures them out, right? She is a, is a detective. I mean, it's not detective fiction in the way you know, hard boiled twenties, thirties, but it's, she's, she's a detective and it's really good. I really enjoy them. Um, some of my favorite ones, I really like firestorm. This takes in Lassen volcanic national park. And it's just the first chapter is about these firefighters in the woods. And all of a sudden whoosh, the fire just rips through before they can even move. Oh my God. I didn't know that that even happened. And the other one that's very cool is a superior death that takes place at Isle Royal in uh, Lake Superior, the national park there. Very cool. Involves diving very deep into the cold waters. So I really like uh, Nevada Bar, her Anna Pigeon mysteries. Cool. You check them it out. Involves, if it involves diving, I need to go read this book because I am the number one diver. I forget. Alan, are you also? I'm a scuba diver too. Exactly. Yeah. So I, haven't, I actually have not been in a number of years, but I, I oh. did it fairly seriously um, back, uh, especially when I lived in Philadelphia. Um, I would go diving on the wrecks off the Jersey Shore. Um, nice. Yeah. You, you like to dive also? I guess the Canaries, you would be doing stuff like that. I am literally the most aquatic person I think you will ever meet. I dive cool. so scuba diving. I worked in a dive center during wow. my my veterinary degree actually for five years, and then I also uh, do free diving. So not only with the tank, Ooh. but also just like free I've been diving. meaning to get into that. That looks so cool. <laughs> it's a completely different experience from scuba diving, and it's I've converted. I will only scuba dive. I'll only put a tank on if I have to go deeper than like eighty feet, and if not, a free dive. Cool. So have you ever uh, dived in the cenotes in uh, Yucatan? 
No, I wish. I mean, not, I haven't been there. Although there's, there's no wildlife and I love wildlife. There's diving. none, but just how deep into that cenote <laughs> can you go? <laughs> That's true. It is, it is beautiful. It is the lighting, especially. Yes, like, it's right. remarkable, yeah. remarkable, remarkable. Beautiful, yeah. All right. That's TWIV 946. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you really enjoy what we do, please support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from McGill University in Montreal, Angela Mingarelli. Thank you for having Thank me you. so much. Thank How do you say Montreal? Montreal. So if you say it with a French accent, it's Montreal. 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 Okay. Montreal. Or you can just say Montreal, but yeah. Montreal. So I should say Montreal, so I'm not presumptuous trying to be French, right? Either way is fine. <laughs> Either way is fine. Thank you for joining us. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent and everybody else. This was very enjoyable <laughs> in every aspect. Let's do it all. Let's list. When we have guests on our show, our entire crew comes alive. And I, I think this is wonderful because you um, instill us with the incentive to go on. Are so you implying that our crew is normally not alive? I am. <laughs> I definitely am. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not. No. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. And I have to say, Vincent, thank you for putting this episode back to back with the Kwame episode. Um, <laughs> it's been kind of interesting to think about some of these topics uh, all so close together. I, there's yeah. lots of references between them. Yeah, for sure. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Jolene for the timestamps, and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.